You think I'm afraid to die? No, friend. In my line of work, there are worse things that can happen to a hunter than death. This is simply a matter of price. In our previous video, we discussed the Grim Hollow Monster Hunter class and the core fantasy of why you should want to play one as your next 5e character. Well, in this video, I'm going to break down the three hunting guilds, the three subclasses that your monster hunter can choose to be from thus far. We're going to examine the core fantasy you get to explore with each of those guilds and then break down how the class features for that guild support this. If you haven't watched the previous video yet and you want to catch up, you can check it out just up here. Or if you want to check out the Monster Hunter for yourself, you can find a link to it in the description down below. Note that the Monster Hunter rules are currently in playtest mode, but we'd love to have you help us test them and tell us what you think and ask Ask questions down in the comments. My name is Ben Byrne and this is what you need to know about the Grim Hollow Hunting Guilds. Monster hunters from the Carver Guild are the bravest and most iron-willed among their peers. Carvers get close to the poisonous jaws, the scything claws, and the necrotic grasp of their monster quarries to deal the killing blow. Carvers pair their physical training with studious knowledge, becoming expert melee combatants whose weapon is in constant whirling motion. A carver's expertise keeps themselves and others others safe in melee combat with constant blocks and parries, while they themselves strike at their foe's weaknesses when they are afforded an opening. Your carver may be heavily clad and wielding a great axe large enough to cut a wyvern's neck. They may be a nimble dual wielder who ducks and rolls out of danger before making calculated strikes. Carvers also have a reputation for taking the greatest trophies from their fallen foes, carving monster salvage from the defeated remains. At third level, you gain proficiency with heavy armor, which gives you added protection to get up close and personal with your monstrous prey. You can't be frightened by monster types, which you have written about inside your monster grimoire, which as we discussed in the last video is the first level monster hunter uh, class feature. And this adds to the narrative that you have steely nerves. You cannot be frightened easily because you already know so much about the prey that you hunt. When you hit a creature with a weapon in melee combat, you can mark them until the start of your next turn. And what this does is give any creature that you've marked disadvantage when they attack you back with a melee weapon. This represents your expert fighting stance and defense, forcing your opponent to either withdraw draw so that they can get a better shot at you, risking an attack of opportunity, or they stand their ground and they struggle to find an opening in your expert martial arts defense. At seventh level, the Carver Guild trait is all about monster salvage, which was a concept originally introduced in Grim Hollow's book, The Monster Grimoire. If you're not familiar with the concept of monster salvage, basically each monster has salvage that can usually be taken from its remains, taking its teeth, taking its claws, taking its eyeballs, whatever happens to be valuable on that specific monster. This salvage can then be sold or it can be used to craft powerful magic items, but harvesting may require an ability check, such as a survival check to avoid getting acid on you or a medicine check to know exactly what part of the monster to carve into to retrieve the magical gland of magic. Carvers have advantage on such ability checks to harvest salvage, which would also stack with their Monster Grimoire class feature bonus of harvesting from monster types that they are an expert in hunting. This means that they can claim the greatest trophies because carvers also recover twice as much salvage whenever possible. Twice as many claws to make that trophy necklace or twice as many vials of venom to craft into blade oil. 
At 10th level, the carver gains an ability called Grave Repost, which allows you to make a free attack as a reaction against any foe that you have marked with your third level carver ability who misses you with a melee combat attack or they attack someone other than you. The free attack that you make in response to somebody missing you with an attack is that your attack uh, can also be a Grave Strike, which is a powerful single strike attack all monster hunters have access to which causes a massive burst of damage, which is not dissimilar to sneak attack or doing a divine smite. The other advantage to playing a carver is that none of these guild traits need to be recharged on a short or long rest. You are always and innately a highly skilled, formidable melee combatant. The Trapper Guild. They trap things. Monster hunters from the Trapper Guild favor guile and careful planning. As their name implies, trappers bring specialized tools into combat that can help them immobilize, weaken, or otherwise gain an advantage over their monstrous foe. Your monster hunter may choose to be from the Trapper Guild if you like the idea of using specially designed monster hunting gear, like Van Helsing's crossbow, or whatever the Winchesters have in the boot of their car, or indeed Geralt's Witcher bombs. Trappers are also skilled at stealth and ambush, tracking monsters to their lairs and then helping the party lay a trap within. At third level, you gain proficiency with the stealth skill as a trapper, and you also cannot be surprised while conscious by monsters written about in your monster grimoire, the ones that you are an expert in hunting. This ensures that you're always the predator and very rarely the prey. The trapper's main third level ability is, of course, their trapper tools, which is a list of specialized equipment which you can craft during a long rest to help you hunt monsters. You can also commit time and resources towards crafting more trapper tools than your long rest automatically supplies, which means that you can expand your arsenal to as large as you want it to be as long as you have the time and resources to do so. Some of my favorite trapper tools include the wear trap, which is this sort of cross between a landmine or a witch's bomb. You can place it down on the ground concealed and get a monster to step on it, or you could just throw it at them in the middle of a combat. It can be used to deal a burst of damage and knock an enemy prone, giving advantage to your allies who can then grapple the target down to the ground or have advantage on their melee weapon attacks against it. The terrain cloak helps capitalize on your stealthy skills. It's sort of a ghillie suit like thing that you build out of the terrain that surrounds you and allows you to conceal yourself more easily, allowing you to lay in wait for your prey. The Scorpion Anchor is also one of my favorites. It was originally modeled on the Rope Caster from Horizon Zero Dawn and was named after Scorpion's Chain Spear from Mortal Kombat. Get over here! <laughs> While the Scorpion Anchor is mechanically fairly simple, it basically you hit with a ranged weapon attack and it can grapple the target. This simple mechanic allows you to stop monsters from fleeing from combat, and it can also bring flying foes, such as griffins, crashing down to the ground. The Silver Bomb is an evocative weapon which ensures yourself and other martial classes in the party, such as your fighters and barbarians, can participate with their normal weapons in fights against elemental incorporeal or lycanthropic threats. It more or less removes resistance or immunity to mundane damage for anybody caught within the Silver Bomb's blast radius. The seventh level class feature for the Trapper is another monster salvage based feature, allowing you to craft magic items and other tools from monster salvage in half the time and for half the cost as it usually would. You are definitely the most resourceful and the most inventive among your monster hunting peers. At 10th level, you gain a bonus to your initiative rolls equal to your intelligence modifier. You can attack an extra time on your turn as a bonus action if you're able to press your advantage against a surprised or startled enemy. Startled basically means like they haven't acted in combat yet. They're not surprised, they still get to act in the first initiative, they haven't taken their turn because you rolled higher initiative. That's startled. It's a new rule definition from me. As mentioned, trappers typify monster hunters that always get the drop on their enemy and are always the hunter, never the hunted. Cut. That's the Devourer Guild, they devour.
devour things. The Devourer Guild is one that allows you to role play the monster sent to kill monsters. Devourers have a reputation as being cannibals, although technically that's not true. Instead of consuming each other, they consume the flesh or either of monsters that they've slain to gain powerful mutations to aid them both in combat and in exploration or social encounters. This practice is often repulsive, even to other monster hunters. The mutations might be frightening to behold and you don't always have time to cook the meat that you're going to consume. The Devourer was sort of my answer to the Witcher potions and alchemy, but I didn't want to make a Monster Hunter that was just a carbon copy of that aspect of the Witcher. Plus, the Living Crucible already exists in Grim Hollow as a subclass for the fighter. Also, as you can see from this video and our earlier ones, the influences for the Monster Hunter are much wider than just making a Witcher class. So it fills a thematic gap previously in the Monster Hunter class of being somewhat monstrous and superhuman yourself. When you reach third level, you are able to carve portions out of a monster's remains and consume them to gain new powers depending on the creature type. The mundane meat of a beast provides you with some instant healing, but the scaly flesh of a dragon provides you with leathery wings for a short time so you can fly around. Slurping up the leftovers of an ooze makes you malleable and able to squeeze into tight spaces, but also makes your saliva acidic, which you can spit on your weapons to coat them with acid. You can technically consume as many portions in a day as you want, though the tainted meat of monsters will inflict food poisoning in the form of exhaustion if you eat too much. And of course, consuming oozes and undead and aberrations just can't be good for you, over time causing permanent metaphysical mutations. At seventh level, you choose two permanent mutations that become part of your character. These include the permanent ability to climb on walls, growing scaly armored skin, or increases your appetite for monster portions before you start to get a stomach ache. Finally, at 10th level, you gain proficiency with alchemy supplies and can transmute monster portions into magic decoctions that anyone can consume. Your ally's stomach isn't as strong as yours, however, and they may only be able to tolerate a single one of these decoctions each day. Unlike monster meat, however, these decoctions don't have a used by date, allowing you to craft a collection of them over time and have more versatility and choice in the powers you gain from eating monsters. More choice in what's on the menu, you might say. You are a monster sent to eat monsters. And those are the three subclasses for the Grim Hollow Monster Hunter so far. As mentioned, the Monster Hunter is still in its playtest phase and not yet complete. The final few levels are coming soon to bring the Monster Hunter all the way up to level 20. And there will be at least one, if not two, further subclasses also added to the Monster Hunter coming in future. If you want to be part of the playtest, you can find the Monster Hunter right now in the description below. There's a link to it. Try it out and let us know what you think. Comment on this video or ask questions. I'm happy to answer any queries anybody has about the Monster Hunter. In the meanwhile, you can check out our breakdown of the first two levels of the Monster Hunter right here. Or if you're a GM who wants to have monsters for your party to hunt, there is a video right here about making vampires formidable. We will, of course, be back next week with another dark fantasy D&D video. So we will see See you then.